Good afternoon and welcome to the final session. I believe I'll the one I will be the MC until the end. So my main role right now is to introduce Uwe Ligges, who will be delivering um, the final keynote. Um, Uwe, of course, um, is known uh, particular around here and in Germany as a uh, very prominent statistician. He's written a book, which I guess, at least among the German speakers, is uh, extremely well received, third edition. And as I found out, there's even a Japanese edition. But um, as a member of the computational statistics group at Dortmund, of course, has also written a serious textbook because the world doesn't have enough books explaining what SVD and PCA and all those other things are, I presume. Um, he is also the author of a number of um, uh, R packages, uh, and it's a pretty, pretty eclectic collection um, that sort of speaks to Uwe. He has looked after um, some bugs, um, so predecessors to JAX and stand tooling for years, has done some work on visualization. If you know anything about what they do in Dortmund statistics, you know that there must be some inference somewhere, and then Uwe's particular interest has to do with treating music as data and input, and the tuner package comes from that. Yet, he seems to have some trouble with test results on a well-known uh, system, I shall not name that test these things, so maybe he should talk to someone about that. Now, Uwe. Sort of everybody knows Uwe, but there may be one or two things that not everybody knows. So for example, we're here at USAR, and I should just use this as a quick shout out to the organizers who have delivered a truly outstanding and fantastic conference for the last couple of days for us. So that's really... <laughs> This, this stuff just keeps getting better and better and better, but it's, you know, as we sometimes say, back to Newton, standing on the shoulders of giants, there was a user in Dortmund, so, I mean, I have a problem with the light in my face, but quick show of hands about who was in Dortmund. So, who remembers that right before we had user in Dortmund, the entire campus apparently looked like that? I probably would have said flute rather than flood, but you know, details. So Uwe basically rescued and maintained the user conference with sort of no time. But that's sort of just one example to dedication. Um, who was in Nashville? So the legend goes that, you know, Uwe had to give a tutorial at Nashville and, you know, being a lecturer, he had other commitments, came, and his flight got canceled. And he somehow sweet-talked someone into, you know, driving him from the drop-off airport where the makeup flight landed all the way over to Nashville so that he arrived at 3 o'clock in the morning in order to deliver his tutorial there. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is dedication. And that, of course, brings us to CRAN, which uh, Uwe will talk about. Um, and I don't quite know what to say about CRAN other than just... And so for the next and last one, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. It's just you can just silently nod or sort of blink. There are a few of us who on occasion had issues with CRAN, and it's never quite clear how it works, so this also holds. And with that, please join me in welcoming Uwe Ligas to the stage to um, <laughs> talk about CRAN. So uh, thank you again, Dirk, for the very nice introduction, and thank to the organizers for inviting me to giving this keynote lecture. Um, now, it's, um, it's, it will be hard to give a talk that somehow beats the, the very nice introduction, but um, at first I thought about what I'm supposed to talk about when the title of the talk is 20 years, uh, 20 years of CRAN. And, well, apparently I should talk about the history of CRAN, but I can't talk about this for 45 minutes. And then I will deliver some information about the current state of, of CRAN and the challenges we are facing, and what uh, both recent changes and, uh, in, on CRAN are and what future changes will be. Um, first of all, 
well, most of you, or if not all of you, uh, know CRAN anyway, but uh, what is CRAN from a CRAN perspective? CRAN provides some decentralized, more modularized way of creating software, right? So we offer a platform for the nice way how to um, write and add software modules to R called packages, and there is a nice standardized format um, that we can use for the R package system. And there's also a standardized way um, for creating packages, for accessing repositories, and so on. And this is a, a, well of the key well, benefits of CRAN having, and R having the standardized way of adding packages to the software. And that supports somehow uh, well well distributed software development where the contribution comes from all over the world. To support that further on, we have some quality criteria checks, of course, that I will talk about later. And then I'm probably also supposed to give the number of R packages on CRAN. And since I cannot count that exactly, because probably Kurt is currently sitting in his office and publishing new packages, and what, whatever number I say will be wrong, I decided to say we have more than 2 to the 13 packages on CRAN. And I find that somehow nice because it also shows the exponential growth of CRAN and you can increase the numbers, don't know once every two or three years or whatever. Good. So, what's the history of CRAN? Actually, when talking about CRAN, we have to talk about where it came from and why something like CRAN had to be invented. And it started in 1976, according to Rebecca's talk at USA 2016, when they started to work on ASAP AT&T. And then, 1992, Ross Ayak and Robert Gentleman started to develop R, uh, wrote some first paper about R in 1996, and as far as I know from my colleagues, the R development core team was a the first, a first formal group in, uh, founded in 1997, actually. In the same year, Kurt Hornig and Fritz Leisch um, founded CRAN, and they took their ideas from some other repository systems that existed at the time, namely CPAN and CTAN. So the guys who um, managed the Perl repositories and the LaTeX repositories did a good job before, and some ideas were stolen from these people. 1998 is the year where I heard about R and started to use R myself. This shows that I'm probably not the best person to, to talk about 20 years uh, of CRAN, since uh, I haven't even used uh, ARM uh, myself in 1997 when, when, when CRAN was founded. Okay, um, after CRAN has been founded, and we do not know when exactly, other people started to provide binary packages for various operating systems. Uh, the Windows binaries were at some point made available by Brian Ripley on his own homepage initially, and Mac binaries were at some point provided by Stefano Iacus and, to, um, and uh, later, until, until today, by Simon Urbanek. Then there is another important year, namely the release of R100 that was supposed to be compatible with S3. Um, who knows when that happened? 29th February. Right. Exactly, thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so from now on you can impress people by knowing that date. It's very, hard, uh, very easy to remember, right? Um, good. Then 2003, I took over maintenance of Siren's Windows binary packages, actually. Um, when Brian Ripley said it is uh, too much work for him, he had lots of other things on his plate. And at that time, we had R version 1.7 something and 195 packages working under Windows on CRAN. And the procedure for getting a new package on CRAN was the following. When it was accepted as a source package, then I took that source package, downloaded it to my computer, 
that I said R command, I typed R command build something, R command, it was, at that time it was R command build minus minus binary, that changed in the meantime, and build the binary and then I checked it using R command check, and then I copied the binary to CRAM, and then I edited the packages file in the repository manually, opened it in an editor and wrote something, and that was quite okay because I had that do once in two days or so when a new package or package update arrived. Well, we are at another point today that wouldn't be feasible anymore. Then R200 was released in 2004. In 2006, um, I uh, was attending some conference. I think it was a user conference, and someone from a company called Insightful uh, gave a talk, and I don't know who it was. It may have been David. And um, I found that quite interesting, and I've stolen whoever that was, your slide. Oh, by the way, for the young people here who don't know the company called Insightful, Insightful was the company that sold S Plus licenses. Okay, and in 2006, Insightful proposed S Plus packages. Uh, S Plus, an S Plus package is a, is a collection of S Plus functions and so on and so on. This package system is modeled after the package system in R, dot, dot, dot. It's called and then uh, the Insightful Corporation hosts the comprehensive S plus archival network, CSAN, as opposed to CRAN, the R archive network. And um, yeah, so apparently uh, Insightful recognized that the um, R package system is a very powerful thing and um, users went from S to R. And I think one of the very strong reasons is the um, excellent distributed um, development of packages that, of course, the company cannot, cannot cope with, with some uh, developers only, right? Okay, good. Then, later on, um, R300 was released in 2013, and currently the R version is 3.4.1. And uh, the most historic thing of the whole story is, of course, that there is an extremely important talk uh, at user 2007, about 20 years of CRAN. Good. Um, now, as I said, with 195 packages, I could do these things manually, but uh, in the meantime, more and more had to be automated, and the package management system has gone a long way and supports not only package developers, but also the repository maintainers. And the key service CRAN provides nowadays is certainly to distribute the sources of R and R packages and um, build and distributes binary for R and R packages. Um, the SVN sources are still maintained at the um, ETH Zürich by Martin Meschler, but the tables um, of R um, goes to CRAN afterwards for distribution over the network. And of course, one of the important key services of CRAN is that um, the check result summaries are always provided. Now, we can perhaps, when we think about how the uh, experience of a new user is, we can think about a package as a product, or perhaps nowadays called app, um, that we deliver to users, and the potential users are some kind of customers of CRAN, and the package repository like CRAN or Bioconductor or whatever repositories we are going to look at is now something like a warehouse-like storage area of applications, and the young people call that app stores, right? Good. Um, now, the nice thing is if the right product for use is not available, you, the user can become a contributor, a developer, and fill the gap again, in this decentralized way, by reusing components in the software that are already existent, and, and build up on that some new package that fills the gap. And that is actually um, widely used. Right, so once our customer downloads a package from a repository, and the package is fine and does what you want, he will be happy and probably stay with R. And if he downloads a package that does not do what he wants, or what he expects, but which 
actually does what is well documented in the package, then it's fair. It is, doesn't work at this, as it expected, but at least it works as documented. But a huge problem is certainly if a customer goes away if the package does not work, right? And so we have to improve some kind of the quality insurance system again and again in order to avoid such a, such a problem. And as well, of course, avoid that some package, the new package depends on, breaks all the other packages, so that even if the package maintainer itself, himself or herself cannot do anything about that, we want actually to maintain that the chain of dependency structure um, is well working and an update does not induce problems on other packages. Um, we have listened to someone whose name is apparently hard to pronounce, so let us try it together. Yves Rossel, right? Um, he, he said on Wednesday he feels responsibility for not changing something that introduced breakage in other packages. Um, I, I like that very much. Um, package, other package maintainer feel, should feel a similar responsibility, uh, I think. And we will take, uh, talk about these, checking these repentances and what happens and how that works um, in a few minutes. But now let's start. How do we submit a package to CRM? Uh, first, well, well how um, the publication me mechanism actually is. First, we submit a contributed source package via a web form to CRAN, and then it's somewhere at CRAN, and then you have to confirm that the submission was correct. That way we check whether the maintainer email addresses are valid and stuff like that. And then afterwards, the package is checked nowadays by an incoming auto-check service. Once that is done, a CRN team member gets an email with the check results and can decide what's, go uh, what's going on or whether he or uh, he wants to check the package more thoroughly. This is in parentheses here because in few uh, circumstances, the um, auto-check service may decide to publish the package right away if we don't see any problems in the package. No notes, no warnings, no errors. The package is already well established on CRAN, then we nowadays publish automatically. Or the auto check service decides to reject the package because there are errors, warnings, or significant notes in the package. Of course, there may be a true, uh, false positive here, and then the maintainer can talk to the CRAN team. Okay, so. If either the author check service or later a CRAN team member decides that the package is fine, then it is included in CRAN, binary versions will be created and checked during the next days, and afterwards the package undergoes a regular check run um, to, to make sure that the package still passes the checks, even if other packages change, if the R development version changes and so on. More about that later. So how many packages are submitted that way? And Dirk already talked about the use in Dortmund. Um, there was a talk by John, held by John Fox, who published um, a paper in the Art Journal later on about the past, the present, and the future of the Art Project, the social organization of the Art Project. OK, and here John Fox analyzed two things. First of all, how our core works on the R sources directly, and there he analyzed the SPN commits of different members of the R core team and calculated, um, the, for example, measures such as the Gini index or simply uh, the proportion of the most active CRAN member, and found out that from 1997 to 2008, um, apparently both the Gini and the proportion of the most active uh, CRN team member um, went up, and he asked the question whether this is a good thing for R that only few members of the core team provide um, so many commits, and um, the whole staff rests on only few sh shoulders. 
At the same time, he analyzed the number of accepted CRAM packages. Um, I tried to reproduce the figure he used, but apparently here we are wrong because CRAM was founded um, much formally and we had more packages at this time here. The problem is that we do not have actual records about that. And what I used here is the timestamp of um, uh, timestamps in the logs when a package was accepted for the first time, and these logs go back to 2001. So that is the measure I'm using here. And uh, what you see is that this is a log scale on the left-hand side, and so we have an almost exponential growth on CRAN over the whole time. Good. Now, looking further, nowadays it looks like this. So, staying on the right-hand side, we see that the exponential growth, um, well, is not reduced. Well, I expected at the time that it would be reduced and may be con converged to something like linear growth or something like that, but that hasn't happened yet. On the left-hand side, we see that uh, the indices are much more... Um, Equal, more, or show a more equal distribution among members of, um, of the core team. Good. Um, so I said we have to de talk about dependencies as well. Um, and of course, you know your package may depend on another package, that may depend on yet another package, and so on. So we have a hierarchy of dependencies that could be broken by one package in this hierarchy, um, where we rely on, right? And that, of course, has impl uh, implication on the interoper interoperability of packages, and we try to avoid that. Now, our check system allows for recursive checking, and um, in order to provide such a service, we, need, we, of course, need to parallelize the whole stuff and to deal with thousands of packages while respecting, at the same time, the dependency structures. How do you formulate the dependency structure? Well, actually, a package's description file it tells us something about the dependency structure, and it can tell you that the package depends Package B depends on functionality in package A in such a way that A um, has to be loaded and attached in advance of package B. Well, please try to avoid that. Um, it is in uh, most situations better to import uh, from the package you depend on, to import functionality of the namespace of package A into the namespace of package B, and do that selectively, try only to import the functionality that you actually need in your package. Then there's some linking to field that declares that package B makes use of header files in package A. These are strong dependencies. That means the, the dependencies have to be fulfilled at installation time of the package already. And then there are weaker dependencies called suggests and enhances. That means some functionality, for example, in the documentation or function or vignette of tests of a package B depend on stuff in package A, but the package in essentially will also work without um, the functionality of um, the other package being available. Good. So as I said, depends imports linking to must be fulfilled at installation time and at least the suggests must typically be available when the package is being checked. Usually two different types of dependency graphs have, have to be calculated now, namely the first one that um, indicates us what packages are needed if I want to install a new package. That means I need to derive the correct installation order and the other graph that we have to compute is what should we check if uh, one package changes. So we will have to check all the packages that somehow depend on this package. So these are two different graphs that we need to look at. Good. Um, there are now two slides that make this uh, talk a little bit scientific, right? Um, I'm using a formula here. Uh, we consider package B depends on a package A. Formally, we could denote that, that A is in, among the dependencies of package B. Um, and let's us further on assume that packages C and D depend on package B, uh, denoted in this way. So with the R here, we want to denote that all recursive dependencies of package um, 
D are in this um, in this collection here. Okay, then once A is updated, we definitely need to recheck packages A itself as well as B, C, D that at least recurs uh, recursively depend on package A because some newly introduced future features or changes in A could have some impact on the others. And the reverse dependencies of A um, have to be also checked and so on. And with the growth of CRAN, frequently an update of one of the packages breaks code in some dependent package and that actually all never happened before 2008 for some reason. So we started with the reverse dependency checks um, in 2008 more or less and uh, where we got caught by this problem a few times. And nowadays we see that I guess several times a week that a pack package would break code in another package. Ah, uh, good. We may even need to update binary packages. That is a problem that is actually not really solved. So if one package changes, for example, stuff in, um, in the S4 structure, in classes, there's four classes, then it could be that you have to reinstall another package that depends on it. Um, and we currently don't actually have code for that, so it is an open thing that has to be resolved. Now, how can we find out which packages are somehow involved? Well, there is a function for that in the tools package. It's called depends on packages where you can insert the name of the package and say which um, of the dependency levels you want to look at, should this stuff happen recursively or only on the first level, and then um, provide either with the installed packages or your machine or of the available packages in a list of given package repositories. Okay, so we have code for that, and then we can take a look at the number um, or of packages that have some level of dependencies in this um, huge hierarchy. And uh, what we see there is that um, actually, well, what does this mean? In the first group here, flat dependency is a direct dependency. That means um, it's a dependency. If I have a package, uh, on how many other packages does my package depend on? And we have the 2,000 packages on CRN that do not depend on any other package. Okay. Then we have almost 2,000 packages that depend on one other package, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, I thought I updated. We have, I'm sorry, we have, um, for example, 176 packages that depend on 10 other packages. And oh, the winner, I don't know if that's good or not, is MA GUI that depends on 37 other packages. Now, looking at the recursive dependencies here, because all of these 37 packages may, ha uh, may have different other dependencies, um, we can do that recursively now, and then we find there's a package called rpanda, for example, that has 151 install time dependencies. That means you have to install 151 other packages before you can install the Arpanda package. Okay, so you have to derive quite a lot of things um, when you aim at installing packages in parallel, right? So you have to respect the installation order and have to wait for the Arpanda package for quite some while then. Good. Now, looking at the reverse dependencies, that means packages that have to be checked after a package update. And on a flat level, that means only looking at one level back, the, we have actually a package called Knitter that you may know. And if someone changes Knitter, then there are 2,161 direct dependencies on that package. And that's currently the winner here, directly followed by test that. And then I tried to recalculate the reverse, uh, recursive reverse dependencies during this week. I did that before, when we had less packages on CRM, and I failed. It was running on my cluster for a whole day, 
it hasn't completed yet, so um, I need other code to derive uh, these, and that's why I have some question marks here. Um, good. But, what's that? I don't know. Um, some well-known CRM packages with an extreme number of recursive reverse dependencies are known, and far more than 1,000 recursive reverse dependencies are, for example, yeah, obviously package nature, but also mass, matrix, test that, RCPP, survival, and many, many others. So whenever such a package is submitted, in order to verify that actually all other packages are still working, you would have to check several thousand packages, right? Each time one of these packages is updated. And all of these packages are very well maintained and receive updates. Good. Although CRM's dependency matrix is rather sparse, we nevertheless have more than 75% um, of CRM packages somehow um, for example, recursively depend, uh, uh, depending on packages, mass, matrix, or survival. Um, when we also include suggested and enhanced dependencies. Good. Obviously, this is a problem given the runtime and many package updates a day, and even when coping with this with parallel checks. We can, for example, also derive graphs and plot them in some way, and here you see for example, the package Laban, the one we heard about in the very first talk of the conference. And if we want to install Laban, we also have to install these other packages. Some of them may be installed already as their base or recommended packages. The other way around, once Laban is updated, we had to check the packages um, shown on this graph here. Um, and this is only first-level dependencies, so not recursively. We so far here, we ignored all packages that depend on one of the other packages except for the one. When we do something like this, I have an old, uh, an old picture for something like this for the matrix package. <laughs> here it is. And yeah, good. And it's not a very well visualization, I believe. Uh, now. Which resources do we need in order to, to tackle these tasks? There are a combination of different flavors of R where we, where we check form. This um, is, first of all, the different R branches, so the current development version of R, R patch or R release, and actually we also want to check for our old release that is somehow missing on this slide. Then we check on several platforms. You want to get know whether packages work on Linux, on Mac OS, on Windows, and then people typically ask about why do you check on Solaris or, or why do you think my package has to pass checks on Solaris? I don't believe I have any users on Solaris. Right? The typically asked question. The answer is I also doubt there are too many users who will use that package on Solaris. But Solaris on Spark has two advantages. One is Solaris uses a commercial compiler and not the GCC or Clang compiler. So we have some platform where we check with the commercial compiler that is different from the GNU world. This is the first point. The second point is that there are different architectures around, namely, particularly the CPU types having little Andean or big Andean platforms. Now, currently, we almost don't have any other um, architectures like Spark anymore, but on mobile devices, for example, I am not so sure whether um, everything keeps like what happens in the Intel world currently. Um, that's why we prefer to be on the safe side and check both things at the same time using the Solaris checks on Spark. Unfortunately, um, we may not be able to um, to keep that service running um, for, for the next years. But let's see. Um, building and checking of packages and all combinations, of course, can be rather time consuming, particularly for checking these reverse recursive dependencies I talked about. And um, we also will, in addition, have to keep the checks regularly running in order to track changes in the development versions of R and see if um, a change in R itself could cause trouble in packages. Therefore, we 
of course, have some, um, well, we believe, we believe that we want to get um, check results within 24 hours, okay? So some changes in Arivel are done, and then I want to know what happens in the CRM package after not more than 24 hours. That's something that I find rather useful. And we may want to check for different flavors of uh, are patched and Arivel. And we want to provide the check results in time when they're needed and not a week later when they're all already useless because we have 20 other changes or whatever. And of course, we also want to make binaries available during the release cycle and update them when necessary. Now, we could look at the timings that we need and the computing resources that we need. And um, the typical CRAN auto build and check machine does several things. It builds a recent version of the development version of R on a daily basis, then it builds and checks new and updated packages. Uh, right, at least for three flavors of R for our release, for the development R version of R, and for the last officially supported, uh, for the last current um, R version that is currently R333, including all the reverse dependency checks. And then we want to notify developers in case something went wrong and provide the check summaries on the web pages. Um, Good. Ideally, the recheck of all packages for RDVAL at least happens on a rather regular basis. The ideal thing would be daily. That only happens on few of our machines because they're not powerful enough, but it happens at least weekly on all platforms. Um, okay. And it is also somehow ideal to provide an on-demand check um, check system for package developers as a service so that they could see what happens if their packages fail or behave differently than the, on their own machines and see what happens on CRAN. Now, how much time does it consume? Going back again to some other user conference, I gave a similar talk um, 11 years ago at a conference, the user 2006 in Vienna. And there we had 750 packages at the time. And it took me 26 hours to run those on a single core machine. They said, we have to do something. It can't work longer on on that level. And even buying a new machine wouldn't give me too much benefits here. And we have to solve this problem. Huh? And we solved the problem by parallel allowing for parallelization of install and check processes. And now we are in the same situation as 11 years ago. Um, on my 16 core machine, um, I need you know, 23 hours to get the installations and checks done for the whole repository. So it takes currently five hours to install all. When I looked at it yesterday, it had been 11,010 packages. It looks like a binary number, right? Okay. And, um, uh, 18 hours to check the whole stuff without installing, um, installing it. So, if we had a single core machine, that means 15 days or more than two weeks, actually. Good. Um, then, after my talk in 2016, um, things have been improved. We um, changed the package installation system so that it allows for parallel installations now. Um, and we relied on, um, we relied on make. And um, it's also possible on user level nowadays using install packages, which gained an NCPU's argument. And then, of course, we need also some human resources for getting the things done. First of all, we, of course, have to maintain and adapt our scripts, the scripts themselves. We have to maintain the hardware. Um, we have to set up new repositories once in a while when we have a new um, version of ARM. Um, we have to handle the errors that are not covered yet by the scripts. That happens from time to time when a new package comes up and does stuff that none of the other packages have ever done and we haven't thought about before and you can't believe what maintainers do in their package. Okay, yeah. Then you have to answer questions because people ask questions when their packages are failing. Okay, um, yeah. That takes time, a lot of time. 
And then, even worse, you have to ask package maintainers, you have to ask package maintainers to fix their packages, right? That's okay, you can do that. Yeah? Automatically, you can take a look which packages are failing and then send out automatically generated emails to package maintainers. But they won't fix their package, right? Hmm? Well, at least not all of them. Only a subset will fix the package. And then you have to ask again and keep track who responded to the email or who did something at all and whose email addresses, uh, uh, where the emails bounced because the email addresses do, don't exist anymore and stuff like that. And keeping track of that takes a lot of time, of course. Good. And then you have to ask maintainers to improve their packages and provide some runtime checks. Many submissions we receive do not include a single line of code that is executed during the R command check. Hmm? So I feel um, uh, like, don't know, I just need to repeat, please include runtime checks, please include runtime checks, please include runtime checks. Okay, good. Um, nevertheless, we um, have to try to reduce the amount of resources we put into the package management because um, the number of packages is still growing exponentially. Um, and another thing is we could look at the incoming checks. Currently, well, I, I looked at the last week. Uh, in the last week, we accepted 234 packages on CRM, inclu up, including updated new packages. Among those were 46 new packages within a week. That means we have of more than 33 successful submissions a day, roughly, and six to seven new packages a day. Um, and typically, we have at least twice as many submissions a day because packages are rejected. Good. Then we have uh, the whole system that we use is um, is an email-based system among the CRM team. That means. If someone submits an email, we get a message, and then we get another message from our auto-check system with the check logs, and then we answer whether the package is accepted or not. So this will generate three messages for a submission, and then we do internal CRM discussions, and sometimes maintainers are asking something, and during the last three months, we generated 18,644 messages, that means roughly 200 messages on average a day. Good. Um, so we, apparently we have to move, do, to move some of the tasks from humans to computers. And nowadays you may receive such a message from our to check service saying, Citron pre-test publish, dear maintainer, thanks, package, my fabulous package that passed the checks is on its way to C right now. And then you can be happy. Or you get a somewhat longer message that you cannot read on the screen now that says, dear maintainer, the package does not pass the incoming checks automatically. Please see the check logs. And if you have questions, please ask the CRN package, uh, the R package DVL mailing list, not us, for how to fix the package, right? and provide a fixed version of the package via the web form again, resubmit it, and if you need more details, there's the whole directory with the, ch uh, with the checks available for you. So, then the package maintainer submitting a package can help us a lot. First of all, by really reading the manual writing our extensions and really reading the Syrian policies once. All right. You have even to you, you have to mark some some button when you submit a package that you did so. But most people use it like the you know the the, the, the policies of, of Amazon when they. Right. Um, so. So please really read that and please really check your package using R command check minus minus s CRAN with a reused version of RDVL prior to your CRAN submission, and in case you end up of. Um, you could try some on-demand check service that I will talk about on the next, on the next slide, roughly. Um, okay. Then Nomadlov gave a talk yesterday and said, leave it there. If you cannot reproduce the serial check results. Leave it there means run R command check. I should have added minus minus a serial with rdvel, what I wrote on the topic above, from the command line. 
and look at the check results. Hmm? Do not use RStudio. RStudio may be interacting. It is rarely the case, right? RStudio works in most cases. But if something happens that you don't understand, run it from the command line. And do not use RStudio then. And do not use DevTools. Right? Try it yourself without having some layers on top of it that may cause other problems. Okay. CRAM maintainers always use our command check. Good. Um, then there are unit test frameworks. Unit test frameworks are sometimes useful because the R-based test, I understand that the R-based test system is not that fancy and does not allow for testing so some things, and you may want to ask some other unit test framework. For example, test that as the apparently most frequently used one. But please use these properly so that they give an appropriate message if something fails, and not that the unit test framework fails itself in the end. So use it as documented. Uh, it is not helpful to give an error matches, messages um, if they give error messages themselves and you cannot see from the check log output anymore what actually caused the problem. And it's a very typical case uh, where you can upset CRM maintainers very easily. And um, yeah, good. Then there are these on-demand build and check systems that I talked about before. One that is actually on the same machine that builds CRM packages is the WinBuilder service that some of you may know. Um, WinBuilder is a machine that runs on a Windows machine and open checks um, on-demand packages and provides you with check results and Windows binary if, if needed. And that machine actually has set up an environment that is identical to the environment um, on CRM. And there's also RHUB. RHUB, you may know RHUB. RHUB is um, a system founded by the, uh, funded, sorry, funded by the R consortium um, in order to provide on-demand services on more platforms, not only Windows, but also Linux and Mac OS are currently available. And I think Solaris may be coming or not. And, well, the it is a non-CRAN service and has not the same setup as CRAN. And I guess there is, or at least I talked to Gabriel, and it is not everything completely finalized. There are some quirks in some corners of the system, of course. Uh, but if you use that and check your package and you find a problem, Gabriel is certainly also happy to know about problems, as is the CRAN team, happy to know about problems of CRAN services that are not working. Okay? So try that out, and then you can already see how your package behaves on different platforms. Um, what um, should we now do beyond the current state at which we are? Of course, we want to support people further on to, to, to write our packages and provide infrastructures and services. That's obvious. Um, we also continue to allow for value-added services on top of CRAM, and we encourage it. There are some, there are such services available. I, s I see David, so Microsoft provides MRAM, so I have a time-stamped version of CRAM, so that you can say, I want to get the packages that were recent on some, some date, right? Or um, there are DX, CRAM, berries, thanks, CRAM berries, for example, where you get information what others think about packages and get statistics about packages. Uh, that's Crantastic. Oh, I'm sorry. Crantastic is, uh, is another service on top of CRAN, of course. And uh, if you have ideas in mind to put something up it, up, it would, of course, be nice to talk to us. Mm -hmm. But uh, we typically encourage such, um, such projects that provide additional services. And of course, we want to further improve the quality of the current um, quality assur assurance system. And that way, we try to keep R being the probably most thoroughly, now I say validated, statistics software product on Earth for some definition of validated. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, because the key point here is that we have examples in more than apparently 11,000 packages now that we, and we use, we use your packages to see 
whether R works in the same way as before, right? So we um, try to keep an eye on that, and that way it is uh, nowadays, unfortunately, also almost impossible, impossible to make, further, uh, make greater changes in R without breaking anything there. But so that may be, may be a bad thing, but it is a good thing in the sense that we can really see if a change causes trouble in, in software and then perhaps also in uh, functions or in code that is not available in Serum but on the user's end. But, but with so many packages, you have um, the possibility to do that, to get that right. Good. Um, then there's, a, I, I'm almost at the questions, but first of all, I want to um, ask my question, some questions myself. Um, there are indeed some open issues in question, and uh, given a package is updated, all its reverse dependencies are rebuilt for binary repository because we simply do not know which we actually have to rebuild. I guess that's already, uh, only very few, but we do that for thousands. And they will distribute it through all the CRAM mirrors, which causes a lot of traffic that is probably not needed. And we have to find something that tells us how we do that better and keep track of which packages actually need to be reinstalled and which could um, be kept alone in the current form. And hence we try to find new answers, good answers on some questions like do we have infrastructure that supports, or what is the right infrastructure that supports calculation of which needs to be rebuilt? and tells update packages to also install the rebuilt binaries. Um, that's a mechanism we do not have. Um, I'd like to have some database like system for library tree. Currently, this causes a lot of trouble in huge libraries with thousands of packages when you have to look into each description file to find out um, what packages are available in such a library. It takes a long time. We could store it in a simple, in a simply in a single place, perhaps uh, from serialized, in serialized form as an R object or something like that. That is something that could be added. Um, we certainly will become even stricter um, in serial maintenance with more automation than, than we have yet. And we ha also have to spend some money for hardware and human maintenance work in the future to keep track with the exponential growth of CRAM. Good. And then my, my last question is to the organizers, how is it possible to cope with 1, 000, more than 1,000 participants in a conference? Okay. Thank you. I think we only have one mic, so if someone wants to ask a question, it would actually be good if you came to the mic or I came to you, so sometimes that's, that's done. If there are questions, it's just form a, form a queue, so um, maybe come to the front and we start with David, and if someone else has a question, why don't we meet here in the corner? First of all, uh, th thanks, thanks for a really fantastic talk. That was fascinating, and I, I've got one comment and one question, and the comment is, you know, there are, there are lots of reasons behind our success. There's the language itself, there's the statistical libraries, there's the graphics, there's the community, there's CRAN. But I think if we were to consider which of those were the most critical to our success, in the sense of if you took any of those away, would the success go away? I personally think that's CRAN. I think CRAN has been the major driver behind the success of our over the years. And it was truly revolutionary in the way that it has encouraged the participation of people from all around the world to enhance those capabilities of our. I just think it's a monumental, monumental achievement. Um, my question related to that, though, is have, can you comment on the influence that CRAN has had on other languages and their package systems since then? Because CRAM was really the first really big one and it is still a huge successful one today. Well, that's a good question and I probably cannot answer it, but well, the, 
when, when Kurt and Fritz founded CRM, as I, I, um, as I uh, talked about at the very beginning, there already were some package, uh, package repositories, so, such as CPAN and CTAM. And um, I mean, there is, for example, the Linux systems, Debian, for example. And that's something that Deer could uh, talk much better about than me. But they have uh, a system where they check and the uh, and quality check uh, lots of packages, really lots of packages on different levels of um, the operating system. So for uh, um, Debian testing and all those levels they have, for example. So there's, there's something different, right? Um, I don't know if um, other software systems have looked at CRAN so far. I think of uh, <coughs> I think of us more as vertical, and you're more horizontal across different operating systems. We don't quite have that, so it's actually it's different. And I think David's question rightfully was was on software stacks, and maybe that just isn't something. I mean, which is just just a reason for another round of applause for the Crane team. <laughs> Hey, so thanks for the very nice talk. Um, so yeah, I'm wondering uh, if you could comment something about the current CRAN um, policy of like only, um, only really uh, encouraging the most recent version of the package. Because uh, in some other systems, like for example, Python in their package index, it allows you to install any version of any package that was on the PyPy in the past. And so I was wondering if you guys ever considered that and um, was there some difficulties, or is that something that maybe would happen in the future? Yeah, that was a good question. Thank you. Um, well, there, there are several things to consider for implementing something like that. Um, first of all, when you want to do something like that, then you have to make sure that, again, the different packages you want to install are compatible in some way to each other. And it is hard enough to do that with the current set of packages, right? And um, yeah, perhaps, well, a CRM package allows to um, describe on which versions of a package your package depends on, right? You can say, I depend on package RCPP version something, or at least version something. Good. But then, actually, we never check if that's true, right? You may have forgotten to update, forgotten to update that information. But once CRAN has the relevant version installed, and CRAN always installs against the most recent version, then we cannot check whether the declared version dependency is true or not. And doing that would cost so, such a lot of resources that we simply cannot afford that. So that's a, f a simple reason, um, given, given, given um, the, the efforts we had to put into such a service. But then there's, of course, for example, the Microsoft service, and you could say, OK, I want to go back in time and want to collect the packages that had been on CRAN on the 1st January 2016. Yeah, you go that far back nowadays, and then you get those, right? And then you can go back in time. But um, all these things do not allow you to have an arbitrary combination of packages. But then you could, of course, get all the versions from the uh, CRN archives. Then you have to compile them yourself if you are on a Mac or on Windows. But nevertheless, you can compile arbitrary package versions from sources because they are in the um, CRN archives. But we do not provide any check services for such combinations, of course. Yeah, because this thing was just to stay just here away from the speaker. Oh, um, thank you for the very nice talk. Um, I wanted to ask, you spoke to a lot of the process there, and I wanted to know one thing I didn't see was uh, what keeps CRAN free of malware? We're sort of sharing packages all back and forth, we're sharing code from accessing APIs to downloading things. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, also a very good question. So on CRN, of course, we do check things. 
and um, for most submissions, we inspect uh, quickly manually before putting the things on CRAM. So this is the first level of typical manual inspection for a package. Um, then, of course, we have virus scan software running open on, for example, the Windows machine. Um, but nevertheless, of course, we can never guarantee that we are free of malware for uh, all the time being, right? <laughs> never of us, uh, nobody of us will guarantee that Siren is free of malware. If there's a question, please come to the microphone. We, we do have time for questions, but please, um, we, we need to share the mic, and one common point may just be the easiest. And, uh, yeah, stay with me. Yeah. And stay with me. yeah, good idea. Um, how does the grand team feel about uh, people submitting two packages at once where you know one would break if the other were not updated at the same time? I've seen this recommended in the our developer package mailing list, so I was wondering, is that actually the way to do it, or do you rather want us to implement um, checks to see which one's installed? Can, can you repeat the first part of the question, the relevant uh, part? Two packages that depend on each other and would break, one would break if not both were okay. installed at the same time. Well, yes. So uh, there is, uh, well, the, the thing is, you submit the one that is most important for the inst um, install time um, order. You submit the package and write in the submission comments that you're currently submitting a package that will break the other package and you will submit that one once the first one is accepted. Okay, or you could even, that's at least the suggested procedure. Hmm? If I may, I'd like to uh, just make a comment that lever leverages off of the comment that David, David Smith made about the importance of CRAN to the development of R. I made a similar comment in uh, uh, edits I made in Wikipedia articles on software repository and package development process, and I'd be pleased if anybody in the audience that knows more about more than I do about comparing R with other languages would take a look at those, uh, uh, those Wikipedia articles on software repository and pass package development process and improve them. Hello, I have two questions if possible. This was a sh short one. First question is, uh, I'm not a programmer, uh, but a user, and I like uh, R, okay, but uh, how can, can you suggest a strategy that allow me to understand which package should I use for my purpose? <laughs> <laughs> so I not create more packages uh, eventually. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> So the short answer is no, and I don't have a long answer for that, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. And the second question, um, I work in the industry and uh, everybody is concerned with the cyber threat. I, my question is, how likely is it that someone can put some malicious code in the package? And is, I don't know, I'm not a programmer, I don't know ah, if it's okay. possible. That was the same question as before. Uh, I, think I, I can talk to you afterwards then. It's open source, right? I mean, there's, there's a thousand pairs of eyes on it, so it's, 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 it's just not likely. I just want to make a specific comment on that point because it comes up a lot in my conversations with customers at Microsoft too. And what a lot of people here do realize, but what a lot of people that are not familiar with R don't realize, is that there are no binaries on CRAN that were not built on CRAN. And a lot of people seem to assume that R packages include binaries that people have created in the cells, which would be a, a significant vector for malware. But just remember that everything that exists on CRAM was built by the system that Uwe just described, and the protections that he's put in place protect those packages in turn. Um, given that that is not taped, <laughs> um, there's one weakness though, right? In order to make it happen, and on, on Windows 2, um, because packages may depend on other libraries, and we now have a sort of semi-kosher form that some security-minded people are a bit more concerned about how resources for the CRAN build process 
get acquired at build time. I just leave it there. I mean, it, it could be more clean room, um, but you know, some operating systems are harder to develop software on and deliver binaries from than others. And I won't say much more. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that's just. But you know, these are processes, and as Uwe said, I mean, we just we just have our responsibility to make them better and tighter. So if someone has suggestions, that 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 would always help. Question or more of an editorial comment? Because that wasn't a question. Yeah, I Hi, uh, I want to ask a question on behalf of the text mining community in R, and I'm a member of that. Um, other languages like Julia, Python 3, have very integrated support for uni Unicode and various encodings. Um, in, in, in R, we still get uh, a note when we have non-ASCII uh, data. And usually for the checks, uh, that's ignored, and we, but we still have these black marks on the, on the check. Is there any plan to discontinue that test or to, to acknowledge that um, non-ASCII data, um, at least d the data, would be a normal part of some packages? I, I, I'm not sure if I, if I got you right. Um, so your question is um, whether uh, if you have character data, um, in a package, um, that character data contains... Uh, UTF-8, for example. Yes, but that shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> we'll take this to our package devel. That, that seems to be solvable with set encoding um, yeah. in, in the description file. Um, so then maybe the final question back to Spencer, who well, promises to ask a question, no, rather than... To, okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll find your Wikipedia agate. So. Yeah, 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 right, sure, 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 sure. Um, 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 well, well then, um, with that, thanks for the audience participation and the, and the questions. It was a very lively and informative presentation by Uwe. So let's now all thank Uwe and... And I think with that, I hand the microphone back to the organizers and bow one final time to the organizers. This was... Uh... <laughs> one conference well delivered. Thank you, Tobias.